Hey everybody, welcome back to Dividend Stockpile. Are you a fan of income ETFs like SPYI, QQQI, and IWMI? If so, we have a treat for you today. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Troy Cates, the managing partner and co-founder of Neos Investments, the firm who runs these amazing ETFs. We talked about all the different ETFs this company has to offer, how they might fit into your portfolio, how they might differ from the other income ETFs out there, and other insights and tidbits that will help you make informed decisions. So if you like that, stay tuned, and here's the interview. Right, welcome, Troy. Thanks for joining the Dividend Stockpile channel. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me today. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your day. I know you're obviously very busy with running your operations to come talk to you know the individual investors who are out there. So really appreciate you guys taking the time. Of course. No, we think it's important to, uh, to be out there, answer questions, and hopefully educate people looking at the space. Yeah, I appreciate that. So um, Neos Investments is um, your company. Um, you guys have a, a suite of ETFs, mostly in the options income space. But um, can you tell us a little bit about how Neos was established? Sure. So Neos uh, as a firm is a little over two years old, but the team has been together for, for a long time. So um, I've been in the business over 25 years, but my co-founding partner, Gary Paolola, and I have been working together for over 15 years. Um, we had previously owned and managed um, another ETF issuer um, where we brought out a lot of the early option-based ETFs into the market. And we eventually sold that business and then worked for um, another firm where we were doing option overlays for large institutions um, and endowments. And we realized that we really wanted to come back to the ETF space. We really wanted to um, build upon what we had started years ago, launching the early option based ETFs and bring out some more institutionalized um, you know, funds for this space. And when you think about NEOS, it's, it stands for Next Evolution Option Strategy. So it's all we focus on. I know there's a lot of um, option-based ETFs. The space has really exploded and has grown a lot over the past couple of years, as I'm sure you and your, your viewers have seen. Uh, for us, it's all we focus on. Um, it's, we're not looking to do a thematic ETF in, in a space and have this as our side business. Uh, options is what we've done for a number of years, and we really want to focus um, in the ETF space on options. So our team, outside of Garrett and I, a lot of our team members, whether it's our marketing department, um, some of the C-suite uh, traders here, we've worked together for years um, in different various different businesses. So we wanted to pull everybody together and really build um, a firm from scratch again, bringing out these products. Um, we have a total of six ETFs now, all option-based ETFs, all monthly uh, income paying ETFs. So um, it's really important to us as we bring out new products, as we grow the team, that we continue to tell the story of Neos and how we've been around for a little a little longer than the two years that we've been in business. Yeah, that's awesome. So even, so, you know, certain people, especially when they're looking at ETFs, they look at how long the company's been in, in business and stuff. So, you know, when it says uh, twenty. 22, if some people might question that, but going back to what you said, you, you and your team have been doing this for a very long time. You guys have worked together. You understand how each other works and you know how to run the business. So even though the company is new, your strategy and your experience is decades old at this point. Exactly. Yes. And we've been managing uh, strategies like this in the ETF space, outside the ETF space. And we really love the ETF wrapper. One, it's transparent. It's liquid. If you buy an ETF in the morning and you want to sell it 10 minutes later, you can do that. You can't do that in a lot of other vehicles like a mutual fund or something like that. So we really like the ETF wrapper and the transparency is one of the key parts. To us. So at any time, um, you or anybody investing in one of our ETFs or any ETF can go on our website and take a look at the holdings, understand what's actually in the portfolio. And for us, that's really important. And we like that part of um, the space. Yeah. So you, obviously, you, you focus on options. That's your thing. How did you first get into the options business? Is that something you intended to go into, like just your personal career, or how did that kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of come about, if you will? Sure. So when I started in the business um, in the late '90s, I started um, on an equity market making desk. So I was trading equities, um, helping make markets uh, with a team of, of traders. And as we grew that business, the options business was a part of that. And I started working also with the option traders. Um, and over the years that I've worked in various different firms, I was always, always either helping the options team or helping build out an option desk on different um, various uh, firms trading desks. 
So it was always part of what I was doing, whether I was trading equities or options or both um, during the early years of my career. And as we grew into, you know, Garrett and I wanted to launch and, and bring out our first business a number of years ago, we were really focused on the space and uh, trying to launch some products within the ETF space. And at the time, everything was passive, everything was index based, so a little different than what you, you'll see now in the marketplace. Um, but we really wanted to incorporate options into what we were doing. Definitely. So I, as you may know, um, I'm mostly a dividend investor, hence the mm -hmm. dividend stockpile. But I'm also very active in the options um, space as well. I do it mostly for the income, so I'm on the uh, selling options side of things. I've been doing that for about five years, so it's definitely been, um, you know, a game changer, if you will, focusing on the options in in my investing career. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people are seeing all the new ETFs coming out, the options based strategies. But can you give everyone a little background on how long options have been around and what people have used it for in the past? Yeah, so the options have been around for a long time. And just like you're saying, there's the selling side where you're saying selling calls or selling at the money upside or out of the money calls where you're bringing in income versus maybe an equity position you own. Um, the other side of it is the put side. People have been using puts to hedge portfolios, buying a put to protect their downside, for example, um, or using an underlying uh, basket of fixed income as collateral to sell puts and bring in an additional income. Um, with that comes a different type of risk. You know, you're selling, say, puts on the S&P 500, you're bringing in a long equity risk into a fixed income portfolio. So in those scenarios, options have been around for a long time, but it, they didn't really come into the ETF space um, until about a decade ago. And um, some of the early ones that we launched were not only um, some of the first few that were out in the marketplace, but they were the first few to take that option income and then distribute it monthly and looking at how you could take that income, distribute it out as a dividend on a monthly basis for people to get real income into their portfolios. So as those funds started to grow, the space started to grow. And then as we look at this really kind of conversion of the ETF market into more of an active space where you were starting to see active underlying equity or fixed income portfolios, and then eventually active option portfolios on top of that. So as those active option portfolios have grown over the past, say, three to five years, you've really seen this growth and this explosion of, of uh, option-based ETFs in the market. Everything from hedging your downside to bringing in income um, to you know different dated buffer strategies. So there's a lot of ETFs out there that use options. I believe last time I looked, there was over 430 different ETFs in the option-based ETF space um, now. So there's a lot for people to look at, people to choose. And one of the things we like to do is come on and, and talk about them and, and try to educate. You know, when you're looking at these strategies, remember all option strategies are not created equally. And as you know, someone who's been in the space and has been using options for years, um, there's a lot of different things you could do with them. There's a lot of different things um, that you could get out of them, whether it's income or hedging and stuff. But you always have to kind of look at the overall portfolio. And that's what's great about the ETF space is you can, like we said earlier, you can go on and look at the holdings and, of a specific ETF and understand what they're doing and dig in and say, OK, is this yield? Can it be supported by the total return of the fund? Is this going to be something that can be sustained uh, within the space? And that's something important. We wanted to not only for our equity ETFs, we wanted to not only bring out something that could give a high monthly income like an SPYI or QQQI or a new one IWMI, but we wanted to make sure that that underlying basket of stocks or, or holdings could support the total return and support that distribution over time. And we wanted to make sure that portfolio could grow over time. So that's how we kind of manage and build out our option strategies around these underlying equity portfolios. Yeah, so to your point, there's so many different options based ETFs out there. Some that are selling 100% um, of the portfolio at the money, some that are doing it on individual stocks, some are doing on indexes. There's a wide variety of different things and also different um, price points. Um, the expense ratios can vary pretty significantly in this space. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of different things, but what would you say is the number one selling point of your options based ETFs compared to something like, you know, the Jeppies and the Devos and um, maybe the XYLDs out there? Sure. 
Um, so there's a number of things when you think about kind of the competition for, say, you just named a couple of ETFs. The, those would maybe be categorized as S&P 500 uh, buy right strategies. So we look at SPYI for us. One of the things we really focus on is the tax advantaged income that you're getting off of the distributions that you're being paid. So, for example, SPYI um, has about a 12 percent annualized yield is paying about one percent a month uh, distribution. And we're looking to make that distribution um, as tax advantaged as possible. So one, we use index options. That's really important for us wherever we can in a portfolio, um, in an option portfolio. We use index options because they do get that 1256 contract from the IRS, which says 60 percent is categorized as long term cap gains and 40 percent as short term cap gains, no matter the holding period. So if you think about these option portfolios, like what we're doing in SPYI, we're rolling on a monthly basis. Um, that's still getting categorized in that 60-40 split, which is really important because if you look at some of the other ETFs that you mentioned, they might be using equity linked notes, which are all taxed at ordinary income. They might be using different swaps or individual stock or ETF options, and those are all taxed in short term as short term gains or ordinary income. So for us, we want to make sure when we're building uh, the strategy that we can use tax efficient um, you know, underlying holdings like index options. We also do look at um, where we can use, um, have part of the distribution categorized as return of capital. And this, I know it gets a lot of people confused. Sometimes we're not trying to return your principal. We're trying to get as a tax designation, part of the distribution categorized as return of capital. And that's done a number of ways from tax loss harvesting between the option and equity portfolios. Um, but where it can, if a portion can be considered return of capital, it's just deferring your taxes to a later date. Um, and maybe that's at a more favorable tax rate down the road when you decide to maybe sell the product. Absolutely. Yeah, the tax efficiency is one of the big things that appealed to me is um, I have an investor, an investor in the, the JEPIs and the JEPQs and things like that. But to your point, the tax situation is just um, it, it reduces your overall return, of course. And yeah. so having something that's more tax efficient definitely goes a long way to providing, you know, more options and a better better product, if you will, um, for that long term investor. And the thing with the return of capital, um, personally, I don't ever intend to sell my holdings. I'm ideally going to be living off the income that they generate. And so return of capital is actually a good thing because I, you know, I don't plan on selling anyway. So um, it, it definitely benefits a lot of us, especially when us that are doing it for the very long term. So that looks really good. At the beginning, you had mentioned you guys have six ETFs. And so I think the most popular ones, of course, is SPYI and QQQI recently. But I do know you have uh, quite a few other ones. You have the IWMI, which is the Russell 2000 small cap based one. Also Correct. have CSHI, which is the short term T bills, if you will. BNBI, which is um, your, ag, your ag bond market type of thing. And I, I noticed you have a brand new one. Um, so yep. just, just a release. So I was very excited to see that. So that one is a HYBI. Can you explain what that one's all about? Sure. That's our, our high yield bond uh, income ETF. That was actually a mutual fund that we acquired from um, another asset manager and converted it to an ETF and added our option overlay on top of it. So we're really, if you think about your asset allocation pie, we started out with three ETFs, SPYI to kind of cover the equity side. BNDI for that core fixed income and CSHI for that cash or ultra short duration portfolio. And as we building out our ETFs, we want to start slicing that pie a little more. So we added on the equity side, QQQI, IWMI. And now on the fixed income side, we're adding HYBI. Um, we also have some more funds in registration and more that we're going to get out. And we're trying to just continue to slice um, that asset allocation pie to get it to where there's kind of a solution for everybody. We look at ourselves as a solution provider. We're not trying to sell a specific fund. We're just trying to say, what are your needs? And hey, maybe we have a solution to help you get that added income uh, within that space. Awesome. So they all obviously kind of follow different parts of the market, but is the overall philosophy of each one the same? You're going to buy a representation of the underlying index or whatever, and then do call options or put options on them? Is it pretty much the same strategy? Um, so for the equity side, we use the calls um, and we're selling calls to bring in that income. For the fixed income side and the cash side, we're looking at very different. We're selling put spreads mm -hmm. um, and it's a very different um, strategy. So if you look at CSHI and BNDI and now HYBI, we're selling uh, put spreads. And 
you know, all of our strategies, whether it's on the call side or the fixed income side are all rules based systematic model, you know, driven strategies. And on, like I was saying, when we're selling put spreads for these fixed income funds, those are different. We're rolling those on a weekly basis. We're rolling in a number of different put spreads laddered out further out of the money, obviously, for the cash side of it versus, say, the BNDI or HYBI portfolios where we could be a little closer to the money, still still out of the money as we're rolling on a weekly basis. But what we're trying to do there is match up the underlying volatility of the option portfolio to the volatility of the underlying holdings of, say, BNDI. So look at AG and BND are the two big ETFs we hold in there to get that core aggregate bond market exposure. Um, and we're trying to match the volatility of the option portfolio to the volatility of that. So when you're looking at your overall standard deviation, hasn't changed much by adding those options in. But in BNDI's example, you're adding an extra two to two and a half percent a year over whatever aggregate bond is giving you. So yeah. that's what we're trying to do in that portfolio without giving you any more risk in the portfolio. That sounds great. And so the HYBI is um, kind of the high yield um, area of the market. Um, I was yep. looking at the uh, the fund page and it was talking about is going to be investing in high yield ETFs. Is that yes. the strategy yep. there? Okay. Yep. What types of ETFs is it going to be if you can disclose that? Yeah. So if you if you were to pull up our holdings now, I'll pull it up real quick just to kind of dive into it with you. But we have a number of ETFs that that it's holding right now, but those ETFs can change. There's a there's a model uh, driven process of different volatility levels, different uh, other different things that go into into the strategy. But we're looking at things like, um, you know, high yield corporate bond ETF or iShare zero to five, zero to five year high yield corporate bond ETF, uh, short term, uh, you know, high yield different bonds from, uh, you know, Spider and so forth. So for us, these different ETFs that are in the portfolio can change over time. It's not a fixed thing like where BNDI were kind of split between AG, AGG and BND. HYBI, HYBI will change over time um, to bring out the best yield um, in the environment that it can with the added option portfolio on top of it. Awesome. It seems like you guys are trying to cover all the different areas of the market and let your investors decide what they want to focus on or to diversify their holdings across you know, equities and fixed income and things like that. Exactly. Um, so you know, I'm primarily a dividend investor, as I said. And obviously, I know you can't disclose what's going on, but how, how does uh, NEOS look at dividend paying stocks? And is there ever an opportunity in the future to have a dividend focused ETF out there? Yeah, there's always a focus. I think for now, we're focusing on, like I said, getting more of that asset allocation pie, continuing to look at larger indexes like we have on the equity side or different um, durations of fixed income or different fixed income categories on that side. Um, we have one in registration that's going to be, uh, for example, we have our CSHI that is a zero to you know one to three month T bill ETF. Um, we're looking at a longer duration. We have one filed for a twenty year plus um, ETF uh, with the obvious uh, option income on top of it. So yes, will there come a time? Yes, I think as we provide more and more solutions, we will start to dive into what kind of individual stock dividend type stock portfolios we could build with options on top of it. Um, nothing planned right now, but that's kind of, you know, I think overall strategy as we continue to bring out good products. And for us, like I said, we've been out for a couple of years. We now have six ETFs. We're not looking to bring out as much as we can as quickly as we can. We're really thoughtful and looking at where there's a demand or a need in the, in the marketplace and bringing out things that make sense to us and taking our time building an option portfolio that makes sense uh, with the underlying risk and underlying volatility of the portfolio that is going to overlay. So we take our time, we bring out things thoughtfully, and we want to make sure that we could support those products as they come out. Yeah, that's one thing I, I love about the NEOS funds is that one, you do have the active management and two, you have you know a very specific strategy that you're undertaking. Um, from what I've heard from some of your previous uh, videos you put out there, you are the ones making the decisions on, you know, the holdings, the options. It's not just a computerized program necessarily, and it's not an 100% of the holdings get automatic um, options assigned or, you know, equivalent. Um, you guys are really taking that active approach to make sure it makes sense as well as to your point, reduce volatility and, you know, provide that stable return that everyone's looking for. At the beginning, you had mentioned you guys have money going into those 
um, income ETFs, you know, NEOS funds have grown pretty quickly. I was calculating just on the back of the neck and about three billion in assets under management if you add up all your different funds. So that's a fantastic result in just a few years. Why do you feel like investors are flocking to this type of investment over, you know, your traditional ETFs or maybe uh, doing it on your own type of thing? I think when you look at what we're offering, we're offering um, a number of ETFs that can provide monthly income um, with a good yield, tax efficient monthly income, um, I think has been resonating with a lot of people. And we're also looking, say, on the equity side to make sure that those portfolios can still appreciate with the underlying equities um, or indexes that are that are in there. Uh, we want to make sure that they could grow over time, whereas traditionally a lot of these buy right strategies, some of the older ones are index based. They're at the money on 100 percent of the notional and they don't really participate in the upside moves that some of these indexes have had over over a number of years. So we wanted to make sure that these funds can participate in the upside, provide um, high income, uh, tax efficient monthly income. And, um, you know, I think for us, I think what's resonated is. People have seen us, they know we've been in the space a while. And I think um, as we start to get these products out and they're doing what we kind of design them to do, I think people are just looking at them saying, okay, if I see SPYI, I understand how QQQI is gonna work in now IWMI, cause they're all within that same equity side. And if they're looking at CSHI, they can kind of understand what we're doing in BNDI and now HYBI. So they're they're understanding how these portfolios would, would work and for us, um, what's really important for us and the team is being available. So whether it's an interview like this or we have an advisor calling in or people sending an email to the website, we try to get in front of everything and make sure we're talking to people, answering questions. Um, you know, if an advisor wants to get on a call with us and really dive into the portfolios and understand how they work because they want to make an allocation to their clients, we're happy to get on the calls. We try to do as many interviews and, and so forth that we can just to get the knowledge out there because education is key in this space. Absolutely. That's always one of my biggest tenets of starting the YouTube channel on my blog and things like that is the financial education, the financial literacy. Obviously, I'm doing it on a much different scale than you are, um, but just putting that information out there, getting everyone aware of what's available to them and what the options are and how to grow their wealth and sustain their wealth and things like that is so important because us as a um, us as a people, if you will, we're not very good at finances and a lot of people are struggling out there. So the sooner we can get that information out to people and they can get started with their investing, even if it's only a couple hundred dollars a month, over time, that's going to make a huge difference. And something like an ETF wrapper can definitely help get you there without the volatility of having to think about individual holdings. That's true. I think uh, going back to that ETF wrapper, like um, anybody who could buy one share of mm -hmm. our product. Uh, can be invested in an institutionalized, um, you know, option overlay strategy on the S and P 500 or the Nasdaq 100. Um, so we look at it as, yeah, anybody who could buy one share and have some some value as they create um, their portfolio over time and get that monthly income if they're using that in real time or they're reinvesting the dividends, however they they choose to do it. I think it's important um, on the education piece. Absolutely. So I've been investing since 1999. So about 25 years now and you know back then it was all mutual funds <laughs> there were ETFs yep. weren't really a thing the expenses were crazy and you get a statement every three months telling you what your holdings are so going from that world and then also paying a commission every time you make a buy or sell to come um, introducing the ETF um, product and then using that ETF product for more of an active approach has totally changed the game over the last you know decade or two so I definitely feel like there's going to be you know continued growth I think I read the other day that uh, there's ten trillion dollars in ETFs or something like that out there now. It just hit a, a milestone. Yep. People are definitely gravitating more to that ETF space, and uh, you know, adding the options overlay is just you know the next step in that evolution. I think. Yes. You know yeah, I agree, and that that ten trillion dollar number is is what I heard as well, and um, I believe it, it it doubled after less than four years. So. Um, we'll have to see what the future holds, but I, th I think you're seeing, like you said, more money come into the ETF space because of the liquidity, the access, the transparency. And you're also seeing, like we just did, um, a lot of mutual funds converting to an ETF. Um, so I think the space will continue to grow. And I think the option-based uh, space where, where we're focusing on 
is you know still early stages. I mean, there's a lot you could do with different option portfolios um, and what can be you know done in the marketplace. So for us, it's um, you know we have a lot of ideas, a lot of funds we want to get out, um, and a lot of good products that we could hopefully bring to the marketplace. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so for those people like myself who do options selling on my own and also the individual investing, what would you say the benefit of going with an SPYI or QQQI that you guys actively manage the options for you or for us um, compared to doing on our own? Because um, depending on your risk tolerance, you might be able to make more as an individual options um, seller. But what's what's the benefit of you utilizing an ETF like yourself? So I'd say the benefit is, you know, use our expertise. We've been doing this. I've been doing this for over 25 years. Our team's been in the space for a long time. Um, so I'd say you're you're leaning on our expertise in the space. But if you look at, just like you said, if you look at SPY, there's 500 stock holdings in there. You know, we own all 500 plus names of the S&P 500. And then we're using index options to bring in that income. It's difficult for an individual to be able to use an index option. You think about one contract of an SPX index option is, as of today, five hundred seventy thousand yeah. dollars. So to use that index option is is really out of reach for for most people. So you're not getting that same tax efficiency if you were say buying a S and P five hundred ETF and selling, um, you know, calls on that that ETF. You might have um you know like you said maybe there's a better result because you do a different strategy than what we're doing um in certain cases but the tax efficiency is not there um you know those are american settled options they could be called away you could lose your position in that scenario where the index options are also cash settled so we're not can't be called away at all we settle them for cash so a little different there but i'd say looking at um, one of our option-based ETFs, you're, you're getting the expertise of, of us. And like you said, you could buy one share, you could buy as many shares as you want. Um, and then if you're not happy with it, because it's an ETF, you could sell it um, very easily, unlike some other products that you were mentioning. Absolutely. So while, while we're talking about that, um, the different options out there. So um, obviously it's an active managed strategy. So the expense ratios that um, are charged for the ETFs are gonna be a little bit more than your standard SPYs and things like that. Um, but it's also gonna be a little less expensive than your closed end funds that are out there that you know have similar strategies where they're investing a certain amount and then a lot of them do options overlay. Uh, you guys are right in the middle. So can you kind of explain kind of what your fee structure is and how people should look at that um, as a um, you know, benefit to them or like what they're getting for their money? Sure. So if you're thinking about our, our equity side, all of our um, three equity ETFs are 68 basis points. So we looked at it as we were coming into the space and launching these new ETFs over the past couple of years. What did the other competition look like? Um, a lot of the early option based ETFs that are based on passive indexes are kind of in that 60 basis point range. Um, some of the larger ones from very large issuers are in the 35 to 40 basis point range. We're never going to compete with them on pricing at that point. But some of the newer entrants into the field are up at 99 basis points. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought that 68 basis points um, being a little more than the passive indexes because of the active management, because of our expertise was kind of a sweet spot for us. Um, and we didn't want to push it um, for these products, for these equity products, any further than that. So we thought it was a good spot compared to what the rest of the market was looking like and where the assets were. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there without naming names. They're, you know, 2.1% for an ETF. Um, and then you have the closing funds with the leverage they have. You can look in the 2 or 3% annual fees sometimes. Um, so 0.68 is not too bad. And if you calculate that out, what's that, $68 for every $10,000 invested each year? So a little bit over five dollars a month to have your active management, your expertise, and your structure in place. That's a pretty good value, if you if you ask me. Yeah, we agree. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, all right. So um, earlier, I think you had mentioned tax loss harvesting um, as mm -hmm. one of your guys' uh, features. So uh, for those who aren't really aware, can you kind of explain how that goes about and what you can accomplish using tax loss harvesting? Sure. So if you think about what's in we'll use spyi as the example again if you think about what's in the portfolio you're long 500 plus equities um and you're rolling an option short call option portfolio on a monthly basis so when we talk about tax loss harvesting we're not necessarily saying sell coke and buy pepsi for the tax advantage 
we're looking at it as more if you have an underlying basket of long equities that you don't really touch as the product is having inflows or maybe outflows, but you're not touching them in a sense um, outside of the quarterly rebalancers or maybe the S&P 500 doesn't add or delete during the year. Um, overall, you have these unrealized gains as the market moves higher. The option portfolio, um, you have a P&L every month. Gains, losses, you pair off the gains with the losses and any gains, um, you know, get that 60-40 split that we, dis we discussed earlier. But with that, if you have an underlying um, rally in the equity markets, and I'll give you an example, say um, 2023, the S&P 500 was up, I believe, 23 or 24% that year. And um, SPYI was up about 18.5% that year. So we captured a lot of the upside of the S&P 500, which is how the product was designed. Um, but with that, we wanted to make sure that the portfolio, the distributions going out were tax, you know, tax advantage and, and tax efficient. So you have that 60-40 split, but a portion of that was considered return to capital. And if you think about what happened that year with the underlying rally in the S&P 500, um, we have these embedded unrealized gains in the equity portfolio, and we have these realized um, net losses maybe from the option portfolio because a short call portfolio will make and lose depending on the month, but overall it might have a net loss. And the nice part about the ETF structure is it's overall it's tax efficient. So that underlying losses, there's underlying realized losses, they could be carried forward indefinitely within the ETF structure. So at any point where we have gains, maybe we have to add or delete a name into the S&P 500 um, equity basket and we have a realized gain there, we could pair it off with a realized loss. So for 2023, about 64% of the distribution was considered a return of capital. The other portion of the distribution, the other 35 plus percent was part of it was that 60, 40 split and part of it was qualified dividend income. So you had this 12% gross distribution throughout the year, but you had a net after tax distribution that was very close to that, depending on your tax bracket. So that's kind of the goal. Can the can the underlying uh, can the ETF appreciate when the market appreciates, and can your net after tax distribution be as close to the gross distribution as possible? So that tax loss harvesting piece is not so much within the equity piece. It's really a combination of the long equity portfolio and the short call portfolio to give you that that mix. Okay, and some of your competitors out there that um, do their options on on the entire index wouldn't have that tax loss harvesting ability, right? Because they don't own the individual companies. So yes, the, it's it could be, and it's hard to discuss other people's tax situations because every fund is is different. When you're looking at it, some are just long a, an ETF and selling an ETF option. So they're very different. Some are long the actual holdings, but selling calls on say 100% of the notional at the money, that puts you into a different tax category versus our option strategy, which is selling calls out of the money on a monthly basis. And we're also not covering 100% on the notional um, per our rules-based model. So it's very different per fund, but it's something to really look at when you're looking at a fund. One, okay, you, you like that distribution amount they're putting out. Can the underlying portfolio, can the fund support that? And one of the things we always tell people to look at when you're looking at comparing funds is always look at the total return, whether it's our option-based ETF or somebody else's and other competitors, because the total return is what kind of equalizes everything because that includes the distributions. So while somebody might have a high distribution, what does the actual total return look like? And that's important to look at. Absolutely. There, without naming names, there's some out there that are paying um, near 100% <laughs> distribution yields. And if you look at the underlying value of the NAV or the, you know, the stock price itself, it's going down over time. So to your point, it's, it's about the total return and the total package. You want both to grow. You want your income to grow, but you also want the uh, the value of your investment to grow over time as well. You know, obviously, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a financial professional. You are a financial professional, but not an individual person's pro financial professional. But just in your opinion and your your strategy, how does each one of your holdings fit into um, someone's investment? Is it a small percentage? Is it a, a replacement for something else? Um, myself, I'm in my early 40s. I'm personally invested in the equity side of your ETF, so the SPYI, QQQI, and IWMI, but I haven't really gone into the BNDI or any of those. So 
So how, how do you kind of position each product and kind of where do you see them fitting into your role portfolio? So yeah, this is a question that comes up a lot. And like we said earlier, we're not looking to tell you where to put this in your portfolio. We're trying to give you a solution and maybe help you with an outcome that you're looking for your portfolio. So a lot of people, you know, especially now that rates are starting to come in, we'll see further cuts from the Fed probably. I think people are still going to be reaching and searching for yield. And I think people want that yield. They want that income, whether they reinvest that monthly income or whether they actually take it and use it for something on a monthly basis is up to every individual. But for us, we're looking to provide those different solutions. So on the equity side, like you said, you're invested in our different um, equity products like SPYI and, and QQQI and IWMI. We've heard people taking them and putting them more in an income bucket or alternatives bucket and looking at not looking at the 60-40 split. Maybe it's more of a 50, 30, 20, 20 being alternatives and this kind of going into that bucket. We've also seen people take it and replace part of their long equity holdings, saying they have a long S&P 500 ETF and they might reduce that a little and put in SPYI for the added income um, mm -hmm. and the lower volatility that that will provide for their portfolio. So we've seen it in a number of different ways. Um, and in the end, I think it's really people are searching for yield. They're searching for tax efficient income. And I think that's where these really fall into uh, individual portfolios. Yeah, it definitely makes it, it makes a huge difference when you as an income investor, if you're investing in the S&P 500, yes, the capital appreciation may be well and it's done very well over the last you know few decades. But the yield is a little over one percent on the SP, SPY. So by incorporating even a portion of that allocation to something like SPYI, you're still getting exposure to that index, but you're also getting the benefit of the income that's coming in. So if you're closer to retirement or you're closer to needing the money, something like SPYI might be a good balance between the two. And to your point, it lowers the volatility a little bit because of the, the income they receive off of the off of the options as opposed to just relying on capital appreciation like you would in SP, SPY. Exactly. That's how that's exactly how we look at it. And and for hopefully for anybody looking in this space and they come across Neos, they could see that we have a number of different solutions that could help them maybe reach those, whether it's income needs or they're looking for a certain yield or they're looking for a certain um, you know portfolio or underlying reference, whether it's the S&P 500 or Russell 2000, that maybe one of our uh, ETFs fits their their needs. Awesome. I really appreciate all that insight. All right. So um, to kind of wrap up, where where can they get more information and where can they buy your funds? Um, so, yeah, they can get more information at neosfunds.com. So obviously going to our website, they could see all the data that they would need to see or want to do research on. We have some videos on there that talk about things we talked about today, whether it's return of capital or how option overlays work um, and also what the underlying holdings are in these in these funds. And how the growth of them has has gone and what the distributions are. I know a number of people will go on our website just to see where that monthly distribution is and make sure um, in their personal account that they receive the distribution. So, um, and where they could buy, they could buy it um, wherever they buy their buy their stocks, whether it's one of the online brokers or through their advisor, um, they could definitely get access to our ETFs. Awesome, I appreciate it, Troy. Um, right before we end, is there anything else you wanna share with the audience about uh, your company, about the future? By yourself <laughs> um, no just listen thanks for having me today I, I always enjoy having conversations like this because I think it just gets more awareness um, out in the marketplace not only about neos and, and what we're doing here but also about the option based ETF space because I think it's important as this space continues to grow and more and more ETFs come out that there's good educational awareness and what you're doing around the space and people could just be more informed when they're making decisions and, and buying the ETFs in general awesome well, again, really appreciate it, Troy. Thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing all about your funds. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll see you around and hopefully you know, people will watch this and go to your website and, and check, your, check your funds out. So I really appreciate your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Awesome, thanks.